Thank you for watching this video from the Center for European Studies at Carleton University. This event was organized by the Center for European Studies and Canada-Europe Transatlantic Dialogue and supported by Carleton University and by grants from the European Union and Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The views expressed in this video are solely those of the presenter and do not reflect the views of the European Union, Center for European Studies, and Carleton University. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much to Joan and to everyone who's organized. This has been a lot of work to uh, bring us together, so I'm very uh, grateful to be here and have really enjoyed the talk so far. Um, I'm also grateful to the, uh, the the best students are always those that stick it out right to the end, so uh, it's good to have people here. So uh, many thanks to everyone. Uh, my name's Steve Hill. I, I teach at Trent University, which is um, um, for the Europeans who are suffering from jet lag about uh, three hours from Ottawa. We're not quite the nation's capital, but uh, we have uh, a lovely setting there. And so I want to talk uh, about uh, so the social friction that's arisen around green energy in, in Ontario over the last uh, 10 years and just give you some understanding of, of the research I've done around this and thinking. I put in the slide, and I'm glad that in the first session that we had discussion and James mentioned about the need to frame some of these things as an energy transition. And, and certainly the way that I see this. So I, I'm, I'm very, you know, I have a very strong support for renewable energy, just in case there's any doubt when you're, when we finish the discussion. Um, a significant support for renewable energy and the need for a, a deep decarbonization transition. But there are competing legitimate re rationalities for that future, whether it's nuclear, decentralized, centralized, um, whether it's driven by the market, you know, how does this come about? And it depends upon all of these ideas coming into uh, being uh, in, in competition. So, yeah. my, my concern, I guess, with that is that if we, if we lose the social license around renewables, that we're going to be in a, a tough spot because clearly renewables are a key part of that energy transition. So the, the challenge that I'm you know, that we have facing us is to uh, deploy this energy infrastructure. And communities can be, uh, often have a negative reaction to that energy infrastructure. And it's sort of surprising. You think, well, what's wrong with wind power? What's wrong with this stuff? And that was one of my initial reactions to this. I have all these products that I keep in my office with, with uh, marketing slogans, with wind turbines and solar panels that are used to sell some completely um, tangential product because of the affect that people have for these renewable technologies. They're trying to capitalize on our, our strong, positive feeling toward renewables. And so it seems kind of surprising. Why wouldn't people like these things? Um, but the, the truth is that community expectations around these things are ambiguous. They're locally contingent, contingent upon histori history and, and, and past experiences. They're irrational. We are human. And uh, they're dynamic, so they're changing. A, a, a quick brief history. I, I wasn't sure whether to keep the slide in because I wasn't sure how much would be covered in today's uh, uh, the sessions before. But this is a quick history of the last 10 years of renewables in, in Ontario. In 2006, we had a renewable energy standard offer program, which was a, a limited feed-in tariff for large projects. Um, it was so successful, uh, contracting uh, 1,100 megawatts of renewables, that the province uh, put it on hold um, to figure out what to do next. And, and that's when the... Um, the financial meltdown occurred, and the Minister of the Environment at the time uh, was sent to Germany to learn about the feed-in tariff and came back with a, uh, a, a clear, you know, gave a clear mandate to do something around feed-in tariffs, uh, widespread, small-scale uh, microfits, and streamlined the, the planning approvals process so that it was no longer in the hands of the communities, but rather at the provincial scale. So the province took over the environmental assessment and the plant, land use planning decisions, and it was removed from any local decision making. Um, so at that same time, the local opposition uh, emerged um, to some of the renewable standard offer program projects, a solar project that I studied in East Hawkesbury, um, a hydro project that was right on my home campus at Trent University, a small hydro, eight megawatts project. Um, and so though some of that local uh, opposition emerged. A coalition uh, at the provincial scale of opposition emerged in the, uh, as, a, as a follow from the Green Energy Act. And it was central, someone's mentioned, to the Ontario election in 2011, and I know Leah Stokes is here and will, will question whether that's actually true, but uh, she has a great paper in energy policy on that actual topic. And then most recently, we've shifted away from the feed-in tariff in, in the province to uh, going back to a, a large uh, a renewable 
pro procurement process for large renewables. We still have a small feed-in tariff, uh, a feed-in tariff for small projects. But we're, that's underway now for, for qualifying large projects and putting them in place. So we've, we've had this incentive, we've had this exponential growth of renewables in the province, um, but it hasn't been entirely smooth. So here's some uh, nice photos. Uh, the, the top one is uh, save, stop solar projects on green land, protect Duro Dummer farmland. And this is uh, an area with uh, uh, five generations of our, uh, Irish farmers who uh, are a really tough uh, lot and I wouldn't want to take them on if I was the solar developer but they so eventually actually the solar developer backed down mm -hmm. the other is a uh, five the solar not on prime farmland land was from 2006 and that was a uh, project that was the project near Van Cleek Hill or East Hawkesbury that was a again five generations of farmers and um, uh, split the split the community split families one brother sold the farm to a developer it was developed as a 10 megawatt solar farm that was built um, and there's a, another picture of people not liking solar farms. So this is utility scale solar. What could they have? I mean, what could, it seems kind of outlandish to me. Um, below that are hydro developments. So small scale hydro development. That's the community of Bala Falls where some of the most expensive cottages are in Ontario. And they've banded together to stop the hydro plant. Um, this has been ongoing now for uh, uh, five years and is still up in the air. Um, there's been a, a woman living at the site full-time and protest for at least uh, 12 months and so all sorts of protest around that lots of uh, lots of turnover in the local government and council and so on um, and uh, another project on the far right is near Ottawa in Elmont some people from uh, from Ottawa might be familiar with some of the controversies that there yeah so so Elmont or for uh, if you're uh, Almonte if you're Spanish then it's a uh, <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a, 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 it was a, a significant controversy in that, in that community. So there's a, some conventional technologies. This is then the wind turbine uh, opposition that's maybe more familiar to people. And this has been the rallying cry of all sorts of groups uh, that have been able to organize at the provincial scale through social media and uh, other mechanisms, uh, driven uh, not by some, not by some, uh, it's not an astroturf campaign. It really is a grassroots movement of, but some people are, are very um, salt of the earth. Others are very sophisticated. It's a, it's a diverse collection of people that are opposing these. I actually thought the, the coalition of opposition would break down by now, but it has not. And so I'm interested to note that. The key point is that social frictions emerged in all sorts of Ontario communities across many different types of projects. Small scale, uh, you know, 10, 5 and 10 megawatts of wind or, uh, wind or solar and small hydro and using different policy frameworks from the RESOP, the FIT, and more recently in the large re renewables procurement process. So there's a, some kind of consistency here. The stated reasons for the opposition are health, particularly with wind, but also with solar. Um, the solar panels might, they're, they're, they have uh, cadmium and other things in them that could cause problems. Um, you know, all sorts of health risks, dirty electricity, um, stray current, uh, that, that's brought up with solar panels. Uh, maybe I'm not a, I, I did very poorly in electrical engineering when I took the course, so I, I can't judge that. Uh, with wind turbines, there's all sorts of work that's been done on, on setbacks and wind turbine syndrome and, and the, the constellation of symptoms that accompany that. And it appears that there are some people that, are, uh, that have suffered from the proximi their proximity to wind turbines. Uh, and so I don't know whether that's a it's very difficult to show cause and effect in that kind of thing. Property values are another big stated reason. My, how do you feel? How do you think my property values are going to go when I have this big thing next to me? What's going to happen to my property values? Electricity prices in Ontario. We do have fairly inexpensive electricity compared to many jurisdictions in the world, but still we want it cheaper. And so uh, any uh, and electricity prices have risen and in the public's mind, many of them blame the inflated prices. Part of the challenge of the feed-in tariff is it shows the price that we're paying to the developers. So when it was 80 cents for a kilowatt hour for a rooftop solar panel in when it first was released, 80 cents per kilowatt hour, people said, that's, that's eight times what I'm paying. Well, that's crazy, crazy amounts of subsidy. So the, the, the idea of inflated electricity prices has accompanied this. There's a lack of trust in the government on, on many of these things. The, certainly, uh, 
the rural parts of Ontario tend to be more conservative and, and um, more suspicious of a, a liberal government that might be more interventionist in the, in the province. And also a mistrust of industry. This, uh, the industry and the way it was structured in the province was very immature and a lot of people could, uh, you essentially could go and speculate and, and uh, like a mining, uh, a mining play. So you could do a resource play on the solar or the wind, and the industry was very mature. People knew that the people that were getting the feed-in tariff contracts with the Ontario government were not going to actually be the developers. They were not going to own the project. It was very apparent. And so uh, some of that maturity in the industry has come, has come about in the consolidation and the, the um, approvals processes, the pre-clearing uh, clearance stuff that's happened with the more recent large renewable procurement process, but it's still there. And then also the legalistic nature of the planning approvals. The, People hated the open houses, and so I went to many of them where the, 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 the strategy was, uh, you know, the, the, the standard open house is, uh, here's my poster, have a donut, kind of discussion about these things, and, and it was almost dismissive in the sense that uh, I approached this work with the sense that communities have their real people who have legitimate concerns. Many of them I, uh, you know, I've got to know, and they seem, they seem pretty reasonable, but if I'm a developer, I see them as someone who's a, you know, either completely irrational, emotional. They're emotional. And how do I deal with that? And so the, the kind of discussions that have happened have been very uh, unfruitful. So it's a difficult thing. But then what is really going on? So those are some of the stated reasons, but I think there's under, underlying issues here. And I, so I started this project a couple years ago about the lived experience of people in communities with these projects. And one of the things that we found with by spending time with people that are living through the process, both people who are proponents, who are hosting sites and also opponents, um, is the disruption to their community and the disruption to their landscape identity and their sense of place. The disruption to the community is, is one of, um, someone may be hosting a, a wind turbine and they'd be happy to get the, the proceeds from the lease, but they actually know that maybe Mary down the road is getting, you know, is complaining of being sick. And I feel badly about that. That's an actual quote. That kind of, I feel badly that she's, you know, she's had to move out of her house. And so that, that's a sense of remorse, a sense of loss that's accompanying that. So, and the division that's gone between families, where you'll have one family member lease their property, another be leading the opposition. Very common situation. And that's, that's a, a division within the community that, that leads to that sense of loss and the disruption. So it's a change. That one photo on the left there is a, a turbine being built in Huron County. And the, the person that took it, this is a photo um, method, the person that took the picture described it to us as, I'm just recording history, was so upset about the soil for that road, the temporary road that would become a smaller permanent road because they'd farmed there. That was their farm, the home farm that was hosting the turbine, but couldn't believe how they were treating the soil. And, and so if you are a gardener, you might understand that. Right? And so this was a very personal thing. Also the helplessness about the, the process of the planning and approvals, uh, the division within the communities, and that there was no chance for any kind of community healing. And the example here is the Environmental Review Tribunal. We've had 14 of them in the province. And I encourage you to go and attend one of these. Um, it, you have something that looks like these two pictures with uh, mostly they'll have that same lawyer, Eric Gillespie, and he'll be on the op opponent's side. And you have your lawyers talking about very specific legalistic details. Emotion can't play into it. Um, people can't talk to each other. It's, so, uh, you know, the, the, the meaningful discussion, authentic dialogue doesn't happen. So, I'm, uh, I, I think I'm at three, so I'm going to stop with my last my modest recommendations. Communities recognize um, energy as a system, the energy, uh, the energy that we get as a system of production, transport, and use. I think people get that idea. But then they look at these projects as just about new production. And so I think we have to frame any of these efforts that we do to put in renewable energy or around climate change as solving some kind of problem. Communities don't see, people don't see these wind turbines and solar panels and small hydro as solving any pro problem. We, so, what is the problem? Deep decarbonization. We haven't talked about it. You, people, in my conversations with people about this, and I've had many, many in communities, climate never comes up you, unless you prompt it. So that should be a real problem for us here in Canada. Communities need to grant consent. This was a, this was a, a, a terrible mistake by our provincial government. Not just be consulted. Anyone who does anything with First Nations um, 
uh, are involved with any kind of resource development, the First Nations will know in Canada that you have to really start to think about consent and not just uh, consulting and, and certainly not shallow consulting. And each community is unique. So having a standard operating procedure for going to consult with communities is kind of crazy. That you have to go and get to know them and work with them. Um, things like ownership or co-management or impact benefits agreements, all those things can work. Processes need to be fair and transparent, not cooked up and uh, predetermined. And that's how most of them have been so far. And this last point is one that I've been thinking about a fair bit lately. It's the, the small is beautiful, which I know um, Schumacher's work, everyone is familiar with. But one of the things that w people that are opposed to this project, that's my last point, is that um, this, they'll always say, well, I'm opposed to this, especially the utility scale stuff, but I like to, I, I don't mind the small turbines or I don't mind the solar panels on someone's roof. I don't mind that kind of stuff. You know, so you'll even have people who are opposed to wind turbines having 10 kilowatts of solar on their property. So they're not opposed to that, but we all know that that is more expensive. To put it on your roof is going to be more expensive. The smaller wind is more expensive. And so we haven't had the discussions about the deep decarbonization. The public doesn't get that. They probably then aren't necessarily willing to pay the additional costs for the decentralized um, kind of small as beautiful type system. So if we really want to see this happen, we, we need to start um, having some of these tough conversations in the province. All right. Well, thanks very much. <laughs>